Closing out the week with the Seattle Mariners top prospects for 2024. Another farm system checked off here as we now head through the AL West. The Mariners top 10 is really good, Jack. We, we've talked about just how well they have drafted through the years. And I think there's also some unique ability to identify pitching talent in the later rounds, middle rounds that uh, is, is fascinating because I think we had the conversation of, hey, this top 10 is all hitters, kind of unique. But then you think about the way that the Mariners continue to just find these pitchers who quickly fly up the ranks uh, and end up helping them. I think we're going to talk about a couple of those guys as well. One guy that's already starting to do that and might be right in the top 10 very soon. Uh, but this is always a fun farm system. I feel like we had a slight lull when they went very aggressive and, and bought you know a little bit after the Castillo trade and did that farm system tick down a bit. But then with good drafting and development and, and IFA, here we are again with a very solid Mariners farm. It just thins out after you get through the top 15. Yeah, 100%. The, the thing that I want to highlight is when you have a pick at the top of the draft, you better not miss. And top of the draft can change in definition organization by organization. So like, you know, Pirates picked number one overall in two of the last three seasons. Baltimore was always picking near the top of the draft. And Baltimore has hit since 2017, the Orioles first round picks, DL Hall, Grayson Rodriguez, Adley Rutschman, Heston Kerstead, Colton Kowser, Jackson Holiday, Enrique Bradfield. That looks like an insanely strong run of first yeah. round picks for Baltimore. And there are a lot of misses in the first round. Like, don't ever forget it. Cody Sedlock went in the first round in 2016. He was Baltimore's first round pick in 2016. So there are whiffs. And I want to highlight Scott Hunter as the director of amateur scouting for the Seattle Mariners. He took over in the fall of 2016. So his first draft that he oversaw was 2017. They took Evan White. That's the one whiff, but like he got an extension. Yeah. He was a top 100 prospect. So call it a semi whiff. Go ahead. After that, Scott Hunter's first round picks. Logan Gilbert in 2018. George Kirby in 2019. Emerson Hancock in 2020 and say what you want about his prospect intrigue, but like he's been a big leaguer that has held his own up there. It's this also year. the weirdest draft what we'll ever have. Exactly. Harry Ford in 2021, Cole Young in 2022, and then three first round picks in 23 are Colt Emerson, Johnny Farmello, and Ty Pete. I, I mean, he's on a crazy hot streak right now. And like, I, I mean, that's how you replenish a farm after you go buy a guy like Luis Castillo. And that's not even mentioning, you know, some of the later round picks that they've been able to make. And Bryce uh, Miller, Brian Wu, both in 2021. How about Cal Raleigh in 2018? I, I mean, dude, they're hitting a lot. And and I think the, the pitching development side of things, identifying, and I, and I think we're going to talk about Logan Evans in this episode, but that's a later drafted guy. I mean, even, even some of their arms who may at best just be swing men. Uh, there's guys that they're identifying from Hofstra that nobody took seriously, like a Jimmy Joyce that, you know, ends up being a guy that will throw big league innings for them. So it, it's just the identification there on the pitching side is really impressive. And then uh, on the hitting side, you know, I think they can look at the first round now and say, let's go that route pretty often. I think they saw the success they had with these pitchers. And each time though, in the first round arms, it's a lot of underrated arms that were still first rounders, but I think relatively underrated. And I think now what they're seeing is, hey, we could still find some really good arms now in the third and fourth rounds uh, and and go get some of the top bats at the top. So I'm really excited to see how they go about it this year and see if they continue the hitter trend or if they go back to pitching. But I think they might have this level of confidence now that, hey, we can always find arms in the middle rounds. Yeah, dude. I mean, think about the schools that they've plucked these guys from. They're going high school bats since 2021. They've gone nothing but high school bats, and I think that's a pretty interesting stretch. That's five consecutive first-round picks, again, three coming last year, that are high school hitters. But before that, man, college arm out of Elon and Kirby. College arm out of Stetson in Logan Gilbert. Like, Georgia Hancock, again, unique thing in 2020, but Brian Wu went to Cal Poly. Bryce Miller was at AM, but like he wasn't lighting the world on fire. He wasn't a first round talent. So I, I'm totally with you. They ID guys that are not the ones that people are tuning into SEC Network to go watch every week. Like they're not picking when Chase Burns is going to leave the board. So they need to go find a guy like Teddy McGraw at a Wake Forest. And, and yep. it works. Yep, absolutely. So let's go right into the names to watch, where again, as always, 
Link is in the episode description if you want to follow along. If you're on YouTube, you can see it now on your screen. Names to Watch is, is not as deep as uh, some other farm systems, unfortunately. But I, I do think that there's a lot that are going to start to uh, maybe show themselves because, again, they, they are so good in these later rounds that we start to see prospects pop up later on. Uh, but, Jack, you can kind of walk us through this shorter list of names to watch. Yeah, so Aiden Smith is an outfielder that has gotten to low A Modesto. He was yet another high school guy. Fourth rounder signed for about double slot value at $1.2 million last year. Um, that pulled him away from Mississippi State. He He's kind of like what Mississippi State was probably hoping could replace Colton Ledbetter. He gives me like a Colton Ledbetter type feel where he's a, a bigger high school bat that has a nice little power speed combination and he's far off, but it, it's an interesting project. Um, mm -hmm. You got any more on Smith? Yeah, I, I think it's just a, a, a fun project, like you said, especially with all the talent that they added in that draft to still be able to get a guy like this a little bit later on and have the budget there too. The creativity with the draft is is definitely – uh, impressive as well uh he's off to a pretty good start for a high school guy in in low a and um i think it's ops hovering right around 800 a lot of the underlying stuff looks pretty decent i think he's going to grow into more power and that's going to be the thing to monitor there uh yeah. but not even 20 years old yet so uh i i definitely think this is a guy that was not far off from potentially cracking the top 15 and, and could be there soon yeah uh alberto rodriguez outfielder in double a he's 23 years old <sighs> Uh, this is kind of where we get to like the, eh, like, is he a future big leaguer? Maybe he's a doubles machine. He had, I think 38 doubles last year between high a and double a, and he hit 300 with a slug over 500 and he walked enough. So he had a good year last year. He's off to a brutal start in double a to open the year. But I, I mean, this is a guy that like doesn't really have much defensive value and you know will he hit enough against the best of the best when it comes to pitching tbd yeah what's interesting is he's good left on left so it's not one of those things where it's like oh he gets dismantled by lefties you can put him on a platoon side like he's good left on left so it's more of just is are the swing decisions going to just always take him out of, of where he needs to be and then that's been the issue for him is uh you know, pretty pretty poor swing decisions that he got away with last year I think are catching up to him more this year I yeah. mean but you have I think I think you mentioned the doubles are a good point like it's it's average power but he, he can get into it especially gap to gap and I think there's there's a platoon potential there just uh, because I don't know if, if he's going to have enough there to be an everyday guy but it would help if he had like splits almost you'd almost prefer right uh, because right. it's hard to envision an everyday guy but the contact rates are pretty good he hits the ball hard enough uh, but I do think that there was a lot of uh, fortunate bounces last year. If you look at a lot of the underlying data. Yeah. Um, Michael Morales is a right-hander and the next guy. I texted you about him specifically. Cause I'm like, I don't know if he's really a name to watch. He's thrown a lot of innings at a really young age. Problem is the stuff at this point is probably not big league caliber, but we've seen plenty of guys who don't have the quote unquote big league caliber stuff that, get there because they mix their pitches well enough. Yeah. Like he can be a four pitch mixed guy. Problem for me is I think it's what 250 innings in the minor leagues at this point, opponents are hitting 270 against. Yeah. Him. Like I'd feel better if they were hitting 240. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's one of those things where he's around the zone a ton and maybe almost too much. And that's part of it. And he's not going to miss enough bats. So I, I do think he, at this point kind of looks like a guy that could just, be a plug-in starter here and there and just someone who can you know eat innings and uh when you really really need someone to plug in but it, it's it's tough to see much more of a role than that at this point with you know, the lack of of stuff like you said and, and hitters looking relatively comfortable against him but he does have the the ability to mix in enough pitches to where he could maybe massage his way through it he's got a fastball a cutter a change up a slider a curveball and and the change up's pretty good so i i i wouldn't rule it out he's still just 21 but with the fastball being low 90s and, and nothing really jumping off the page, it, it does make it tough for him. And like you said, opponents hitting 270 against him, like you're going to need to miss more bats than that. And we haven't even seen him above high A yet. So right. it's tough. But he's still a name to watch because I think there's between the command and at least a deeper arsenal. Uh, I think there's a way that he can at least be, you know, a swingman type if, if the pitchability continues to come along.
you want to talk swingman Jimmy Joyce later round pick in 2021 out of Hofstra. And it's kind of weird because like pre COVID you see 16th round, you say middle round. Now it's later round. And frankly, like I kind of enjoy that over the 38, 40 rounds that we got in the MLB draft before. Like it was cool to have, you know, some of those high school guys that were nowhere close to even signing that it's like, Oh yeah, they were picked in the 37th round or whatever. But now, like, I appreciate that the 16th round is the later rounds. Jimmy Joyce is already in double-A. Fastball change-up guy. You've gotten here fastball tick up. He's he's into the low to mid-90s now. Um, seems like a swing man and a guy that can pound the zone with a fastball change-up combo. And, and that feels like three innings of middle relief when you've got a bullpen day. Yeah, I think that's exactly the role for him. And the fastball ticked up to 93 last year. Unfortunately, dealt with a little bit of a forearm strain. Uh, and and got a late start to the year, but he's already re, like back in rehab. Uh, and I think he, he threw a couple days ago. Uh, nice. Fastball Velo wasn't quite back yet. I think it was more 90, but he's already back throwing. So should be potentially rejoining double A in the next week or two. Uh, but that, that's a guy that I think is high floor, will throw some big league innings. It's above average changeup, throw strikes, gets a ton of weak contact. Uh, it's just a good depth arm. Dowell Joseph, you have anything? <laughs> No. I just kind of I, I regurgitated whatever I could find on Dowell Joseph, who is 16 years old. He's a bigger 16 year old. He recently hit a growth spurt where he was being monitored when he was like 5'10, 5'11, and he was flying on the base pads. Now he's like 6'2, buck 85 at shortstop. He's still got $3 million for the price tag. Again, he's still 16. Um, I think it's what, late, late June or something? Yeah. Um, I mean, this guy, when you sign for that much money and apparently you have the makings of a smooth power hitting shortstop, like you'll make the names to watch for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's all I got. I haven't seen much other than the, the limited, you know, YouTube video that you're going to get and, and a little here and there, but big prized international free agent, you know, and the Mariners have done pretty decent in that, in that realm. Like he's going to be a name to watch when you're making that, when you're getting the $3 million bonus and to, to have that growth spurt. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see, if he's a little bit stiffer now, how he moves, but if things look as good as they looked before that, that shot up physically, uh, you know, this could be the next guy that kind of becomes a popular you know, lower level IFA guy. Yeah. Interesting name here is Brody Hopkins, the younger brother of TJ Hopkins, who is the outfielder for what Cincinnati. And now I think he's in Sacramento. Is that right? Um, I, I think I think giants triple a, but Brody Hopkins was a guy that was hitter primary at college of Charleston. Then for his junior year, he transfers to Winthrop, and he does both. And he was like a good hitter. He was walking the world as a pitcher at Winthrop, but the Mariners took him as a pitcher. And I think what they see is a guy that is so early in his maturation process that did punch out 66 in 54 innings. And like at the end of the day, this guy can run it up to the mid nineties. Opponents are hitting a buck eighty two against him so far in seventeen and two thirds innings. So like, he's got the stuff, and I think they're hoping the more he dives into pitching full time, the more complete of an arm he will look like. I mean, it's hard to argue against the stuff so far. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm watching. You know, I mean, you yeah. got shorter spurts right now, but I, a couple of the first outings were phenomenal, and you have the second or third outing of his pro career. He goes, I know it's low A, but he goes five innings of one run ball, eight Ks, fastball sitting 94, 95. And it ticked up in his last outing where he was sitting closer to 95, 96. So yeah, now focusing more on, on the pitching side, definitely worth monitoring. Yeah. And then last guy is is Walter Ford. Interesting one here. Walter Ford is a guy that was what running it up to the mid 90s as a high school guy, was gonna go go both ways at Alabama. He was a talented hitter as well. Um, but he signs for decent money as a 74th overall pick in 2022. He shows up to the complex and mid nineties turned into like 88, 89. Yeah. And that's really concerning. He's thrown 25 at a third innings opponents hit 294 against him. It's way too early because he's still just 19, but like he's got to get back to the mid nineties. Yeah. So first time out of the complex back up to 90, 91. Okay. So, getting back there but that's also where he was in the early part of last year and then it tapered off so just something you just got to monitor but i agree i mean for him to to be 
the guy that they drafted, it can't be 89, 90. It can't even be 90 to 92. It's got to be more 93 to 90, 95. But he does have good characteristics. And we know the Mariners love those types of fastball characteristic guys. And he's got that. Uh, so that does help hedge some of the the concern there. But he still needs to be, you know, above 90. Uh, and, and, and that's, it's really just going to be, I hate that it has to be a velo watch, but with a guy like Ford, it's got to just be a velo watch with him. Yeah. Going into the top 15, start with Ryan bliss, who is a second baseman. I think by any team, you know, any team that's looking at him and trying to, you know, project him and, you know, where they regard him as a, his long-term position, but he's been playing more shortstop given the situation that, you know, the Mariners kind of have going on right now with, with Crawford Hurd and, you know, just maybe having somebody else there that is, is a fallback plan just in case uh, anything else happens at the big league level. I, I think Bliss, the fact that they're doing that is a testament to the fact that he's a really good athlete and, and can play there in a pinch. Ultimately, second base is, is the spot for him. Uh, he was traded over in that Rojas deal. And, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to decide where I stand on, on Bliss because – I love the player, like in terms of the way he goes about the game. It's it's hard nosed. It's like all the same reasons why I love John Birdie. Mm-hmm. But you also know that a player like that is is a little bit more limited. Um, I, I see a, a bench utility, potentially platoon type of role here still with the speed, with some versatility, uh, the ability to out slug. I think the EVs to to a degree. Yeah. Uh, and 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 just a, a hard nosed approach to the game. Do you question the hit tool a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see yeah. forty on it. Like I even yeah. questioned forty a teensy bit. And I, I think you pull up the baseball reference page and you see that he hit three hundred last year. It's like, oh, how can he be a forty hit guy? He was playing in some of the more hitter friendly environments at all of baseball. So you have to take that into account. Twenty three homers. You kind of take that into account too. He seems like a, a ten homer guy. But if you're 230 with 10 homers, you better be stealing all the time. And he does. Like, you've got 60 runner. This guy stole 55 bags last year. He's more efficient this year. He's 18 for 21 in his first 35 games Mm -hmm. in Tacoma. And that's hugely important. Yeah, he stole 55, but he was caught 15 times. You can't get caught 15 times. You can get caught three times in 21 attempts. I think if that continues to prove to be the case, and this guy is like, 30 for 35 in the stolen base department. We're looking at a guy that is destined for a big league bench. I, it almost feels like, I, like I, I don't want to say Edmundo Sosa because everybody, I feel like everybody you can comp to Edmundo Sosa, but at the and end he's of the got day, the defensive value at shortstop. Yeah, Sosa's got the defensive value at short. Like, I, I think it is more of like the birdie, Tony yeah. Kemp's of the world, the those types of players. Yeah, because like Kemp can't play short. He really never did. Birdie, Birdie really shouldn't have played short. Yeah, he like he was, but he shouldn't. Yeah, I like I like that. the Birdie one better. It's kind of that. And uh, I mean, what a deal that was anyways, even if Bliss is just a bench guy, to to get Rojas coming over, uh, to get Canzone coming over. And, sure. you know, of course, they gave up Seawald, and they probably could have used him at points, and he played you know, a pretty big role in what the D-backs did. But nice deal for them. And, yeah, at the very least, like Bliss has utility on that 40-man roster for sure. For sure. uh, I think that's something that you can you can confidently set. Yeah, fourteen. I know is a name that you like, and you're excited to see back on the bump. Hopefully sooner rather than later. Teddy McGraw, right hander, Wake Forest kid that unfortunately has already undergone two Tommy John surgeries. Was tracking like a first rounder, and, and I had a fun time watching uh, some of the the innings from his like Stars and Stripes outing. It was probably the lot one of the last times we saw him in a game setting, uh, throwing at Truist against Langford and. Uh, you know, all these different top top bats in the class at the time in 2022. Uh, so it was it was against some really impressive bats, and I think that's where he really started to solidify himself after a strong finish to the collegiate season. Had a couple great starts on the Cape, and then goes out and throws well in that setting as well. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of teams that I think had a first round grade on him, the Mariners included, and unfortunately, before the season started. Uh, found out he had to undergo his second Tommy John surgery. First one came around in in, in high school. I mean, it's it's a mid nineties fastball up to ninety eight with a ton of run and it's heavy. A lot of ground balls, a slider that's an easy plus pitch, 
And he's mixed in a change up too. I think the command's going to be an issue, especially now after two Tommy Johns and it already was fringy. It's probably a, a, a reliever role here, but you know, I would never rule out a pitcher this talented. And uh, I mean, the Mariners still taking him in the third round. I know it was 20% under slot, but the fact that they took him in the third round, despite multiple TJs, I think shows you how high they are on him. And uh, I think that says a lot. Yeah, I think they we're talking about the best future swingman in the Mariners organization at this point. Like we talked about two swingmen and the name to watch, but like this guy feels like the best version of a swingman that we've got in, in you know prospect areas if he comes back to full health. You know, I kind of I kind of worry about the sinker changeup guys and that fastball, like y- you mentioned it, it, it plays well at the bottom and it's not really gonna like have riding life and get about a s- bunch of swing and miss. The good thing is, like, his slider is his best pitch. Sinker changeup guys worry me because they can't get the whiff when they need it. He's got the whiff pitch. And you've got 40 on the changeup. He throws the changeup more than you probably should for a 40 pitch. At least he did when he was at Wake. So, you know, like, I'm thinking about a guy that is going to go two innings out of a bullpen, and and he makes you feel really good because he got through two innings and 18 pitches because he rolled five ground balls. 100%. And that slider is is the put you away pitch at yeah. any point with two plane break. It's sharp. And if that pitch is still there for him when he comes back, I mean, that, that'll make sure he's in a big league bullpen at the very least. Yeah. 13, Ben Williamson, third baseman who they took in the second round out of William and Mary. Very high floor, I think, relative to a lot of other prospects in that range because he's a great third baseman defensively. He's got a good field to hit. And there's doubles power. It's a weird profile because you're looking at fringy game power for a third baseman. Mm -hmm. But you imagine if he's a good third baseman, they've already given him action at shortstop too. Like he's he's such a good third baseman that he can plug in at short. He could definitely play second base. He can obviously play first. I think you're looking at a platoon type of role here uh, with Williamson. But there might be enough offense there to – you know, be a second division regular, be a guy that can fill in and, 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 you know, hold it down. I see average hit tool. If it's 15 home run power with an average hit tool and kind of average run, average plate discipline and great defense, that's going to be a positive war player. That's going to be a, a potentially even two and really good seasons, three win player if it all works out. Uh, but I, I see more of the one to two war uh, utility platoon guy that, I think is 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 a nice piece. Have you ever been on that campus, William and Mary? No. It's a weird one, man. The vibe is I'd just imagine. odd. It's very colonial. And I know that they are yes. in the colonial, but like it's very like, oh, she's going to churn butter because they do tours here. Like that kind of thing. Um, weird campus. But Ben Williamson, do you feel like he can be a doubles guy? Like the For final sure. form of him offensively, it's it's not homers, but like it could be gap to gap some doubles. Yeah. If it, that's going to be where he needs to achieve the slug is it's going to yeah. be, need to be a ton of doubles. Uh, and, and I think he can do that. And we're already kind of seeing that this year where he's slugging 468. He has one Homer. And I know it's early. It's small sample size, but we got 28 games. He's got 12 doubles and a triple. So that that's where he could end up becoming a regular. And the thing is, is that would put more pressure on the hit tool still. So like that hit tool would need to be above average. It, it might be better than a 50. You know, I, I honestly think that when you look at what he was doing last year and the year before, it, I think most of the draft grades, if you look at other evaluators, probably had him at an average hit tool. But so far out of the gate, man, the, the contact rates have been really good. Uh, but he is a college bat in high A, so you have to take that a, a bit with a grain of salt, but really good contact rate. So if he's closer to the 55, potentially, if he's a 60 hit tool guy, then he can really justify, you know, doubles, potentially play every day. And, you know, you're giving up power at third base, but if you don't have a better option, that's a guy that could plug in and be more than fine and be an average regular. Uh, But, you know, that might be a little bit ambitious. We'll see if the whiff starts to tick up in double A. But if it's more average to above average hit tool with kind of everything else kind of average above across the board, um, I think it's kind of second division regular potential with a, a really solid utility to platoon piece. Cool. Number 12, Jeter Martinez right-hander who signed for $600,000 in 2023 was ridiculous in the DSL last year, a 172 ERA as a 17 year old. And 
he had just turned 17. Like he, he just turned 18 this year and he'll be at the complex. 6'4, 185 pounds. His fastball's ticked up. And, and that's the thing that I don't I don't know if it's on a ton of people's radar yet. I know that he was on people's radar because of what he did at the DSL, but he was doing that more 92, 94. Now he's more 94, 96. And I've seen him grab a seven and eight during the spring and leading into the the season here. And in his first outing was kind of more of the same. You got that with the heater. You've got, you know, a slider that looks like it could be a plus pitch and a changeup that he's mixed in that has looked fine. He controls his body pretty well for a big 18 year old. And I think he could grow into average command. Martinez is, is a breakout name to watch. I think he's probably the breakout name in this system. No, the floor is yours on this one, man. I've never seen this guy throw a pitch, but I just got I got the classic 12:30 in the morning text, Jeter Martinez. And I wake up at like, you know, 7 30 or 8, and I'm just like, who? And I just have to believe you. So you know what? I believe you. I'm excited to see the clips that go viral of him throwing in the complex that are filmed via like, do people still use camcorders? I um, you know what? at the complex, yes. They like yeah. set up or like at games, a lot of like a lot of folks that are covering them, baseball America folks, things like that, they set up like the uh, the old uh, video camera. We got to get you a camcorder. Um, you know, I know. Who I know. Has, you know who else has one is uh, Chet Holmgren's dad. When when Chet was at Gonzaga, like Chet's dad was always filming him with camcorders, and I was like, okay, cool. Um, it's like, but it's like the old yeah. dunk contest footage, yeah. Yes, exactly. So I need some of that footage of Jeter Martinez, and then I can give you my my sweeping hot take that he's going to win a couple of Cy Youngs. <laughs> I, I'm just. Interested to see if the velocity holds because, yeah, yeah great. It's he's, he's ticked up in the early going this year, but is he going to hold it as the season progresses? That's the thing to monitor. But first pro outing or first first complex outing, three innings of one run ball, and I mean the the, the heavy fastball, the slider it seems to be a trend that they like here. Is that that running fastball with the slider going the other way? This is more of a two planer, uh, and then the changeup already looking like a decent pitch. Again, Martinez is that breakout guy for me in this system potentially because oh. number 11 is already breaking out, yeah. and that's Logan Evans. Uh, Evans might be a guy that's in the top 10 in the next month or two. It's just not enough of a sample size quite yet to get him into the top 10, but just another example of the Mariners doing well in later rounds, right? I mean, Logan Evans was a 12th round pick in 23, and they assigned him straight to double. Like, that's how much they think they thought of him immediately. And I think that's how much he impressed them at, at, during spring training and during camp. So he gets sent straight to double a as a 12th round guy and has been awesome has been their best pitcher in their system pretty much this year. And has been one of the more impressive arms in the minor leagues, especially at the upper levels so far this year, doesn't turn 23 for another, I think week or so, or actually no, another month. He turns 23 in a month. And you've got a, just a really unique arsenal of six pitches, five, six pitches that he can come at you with. Fastball isn't great from a shape standpoint, but he – actually, I'll take that back. The extension's not great. There's nothing that jumps off of the page, but he gets a ton of arm side run that helps him get plenty of ground balls. Then you have a slider working off of that that has crazy sweep, so he's generating a rare amount of horizontal or, or lateral – uh, separation there that makes his slider just menacing. And he's really confident with it. He throws it nearly a third of the time. He commands it east and west. And then that curveball has become more of a downer that he can use more confidently to lefties and is separated more from the slider. And he's mixed in some good changeups. This guy can pitch. Yeah. He can clearly pitch. Um, I, again, like, and you've got it here in the first line. Like, sometimes it just doesn't make any sense. Like he was a not good reliever at Penn State. And then he was a fine Sunday guy at Pitt for two years. He had an ERA just under seven in college baseball. And now he's got an ERA just over one in the minor leagues. Um, he screams very subdued, very subdued Logan Webb type thing where the profile is darting left, darting right, darting left, darting right. And those guys are going to get outs at the major league level. The best version of that is a top five pitcher in the game in Webb. Yeah. But Evans is a tall guy that is playing essentially blitz ball. And, you know, like the sinker's not as good as Logan Webb. It, it's like a 
it's a sinking fat, like a two seam. It, like Webb's, Webb's is like a 65, 70 grade fastball. His is a 50. But if you've got that kind of movement profile where you're not a north south guy, like you are truly an east west guy at the knees, I mean, it is so hard to deal with you as yep. a professional hitter. And I think we're seeing that in the minor leagues right now where everything is at the knees, but it can be knees inside, knees outside, knees farther in, knees farther out. And it's amazing just, I think, the way that he's able to operate east-west with so much confidence, rarely running things back over the middle and missing, you know. Uh, it, it just seems like it's on and the it, outer third, then, like, on the inner third. And even then, what does what does running something over the middle look like? Because it starts on the outer third, right? Like, yeah, exactly. There's and nothing that's really the ground ball. Yeah. Usually, and he's got a 54% ground ball rate so far this season, but that's gone up and up each start. Uh, the, 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 the slider commands, what really stands out to me, watching him backdoor that thing, then bury it on lefties. But now the curveball, he's using it more and more and more with that separation in terms of shape. And it's averaging like 3,100 RPM. So he, he has a feel to spin it for sure. Uh, this is a guy that I wouldn't be surprised if that fastball ends up playing closer to an above average pitch. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up being a, a guy that quickly becomes a top 10 prospect in the system. And, I think a a potential back end of the rotation starter for them. He kind of screams innings eater and screams, uh, I think, ground ball machine that in their ballpark, especially, you know, won't get burned much when he does leave it up, which isn't very often right now. And when you can go slider, which he also manipulates, there's some sliders he's thrown with 20 inches of horizontal. There's some that are shorter and a little bit harder. Then you have that curveball. You have the sinker. You have sometimes a more straight four seamer that'll sneak up. It's not great, but it's just a change of eye level. And then a cutter and a change up as well. It's that kitchen sink that with the stuff getting better and better and the command getting better, there's a back end of the rotation guy here. All right, number 10, Michael Arroyo. One of the more, I would say, accomplished hitters you're going to see for how young he is and already how much success he has had in full season ball. Still 19 years old, will be 19 years old for the entirety of the season. And we already had success at the low A level from him last year. And then this year, already swinging it pretty well. At low A again, a little bit more swing and miss so far this season at points, but overall, it, it's just hard to argue against the numbers that he continues to put up. He's got a good approach. He hits the ball very hard for a guy that's five seven, five eight, uh, and and also, uh, I, I think he's someone that will surprise you with the way he's able to elevate and, and sneak balls out to the pull side. Another doubles machine type of guy that probably hits just ten to fifteen home runs, but when you got plenty of doubles to all fields, pretty good feel to hit good pitch rec skills already. It's just hard to figure out where he's going to play defensively because yeah. he doesn't move great. He, he's improved a ton to where I think he can stay at second base, but he didn't really have a choice because you're not putting a five, seven, five, eight guy at first base. So it is nice to see that the defense has come along to the point where I think he can be an average ish defender or close enough. Uh, but it's going to be all about the bat with Arroyo at that, at this point is now that he's gotten to the point where he's passable at second. I can tell you why he doesn't move well. Guy's a fire hydrant. Like he, he managed to put on more weight on his quads and hammies than like anybody this offseason. Seeing the video of him and Modesto is so funny because like he does look like a fire hydrant more so than other fire hydrants. Like we call Altuve a fire hydrant. Altuve's flexible. This guy like is actually just short and sturdy and it's really impressive. Um I like yes, I I totally understand the limitations. I like that he walks as often as he does. He's not a guy that is going to overcompensate. You know, sometimes we see the shorter guys kind of swing out of their shoes, neck high, shin high. They'll have larger zones because they're trying to compensate for, you know, lack of plate coverage, I guess. Um, but you should but be leveraging your smaller zone. Exactly. Embrace the short. And, and it <clears throat> feels like Michael Arroyo embraces the short. Yeah, like Jet Williams does and like Tamar yeah. Johnson does. And, and that's, you know what some of the best smaller hitters do. And I'm, I'm curious how much power he can grow into. Cause like you said, he's already built. I think it's really just going to become a matter of elevating more consistently and just squaring balls up more consistently. It's not always going to hit the ball harder. He doesn't really need to hit the ball that much harder. He's a 90th percentile of 103 and a half, which is really good for his size. And, and it's not just off of this year's sample. It was 103 and a half last year too. So I think you can feel pretty good that the EVs are going to be pretty much close to league average. And that's all you need from a guy that has the approach that he has and has the feel to hit. My one concern with him is with his load, you'll see his foot and where he lands sometimes. 
he'll close himself off. And I think good pitchers will, can tie him up inside. So just something to watch with his swing mechanics is he likes to coil in. That's great. But it's resulting sometimes in him closing himself off. And then it's really hard to get it out. Uh, and he can get crowded inside. But so far, it hasn't been too much of an issue. And he has freak hands to where sometimes when he looks crowded, he still gets to a pitch. I mean, I saw one that he hit that literally looked – I think the pitch would have hit him if he didn't make contact with it. And he made contact with it and kept it fair. So he's got a very unique feel for the barrel as well. Nice. Number nine, Jonathan Class A. He got a cup of coffee in the big leagues when the Mariners were in a pinch, but back down in Triple A. And it was it was an aggressive push, anyways. Yes. We talked about that. We said, well, well, it'll be a good experience for him. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how long they keep him up there. And you know, it was a handful of games and it wasn't great. He had a couple decent games, but overall wasn't great. Sent back down. He's not even 22 yet. So this is kind of a prospect fatigue guy too, I feel like, because he's flown through the minor leagues quickly. Now gets a big league opportunity. Doesn't do great. Goes back to AAA. And if he's not lighting it up, I think people might quickly start to overlook him. And I think that might be a little unfair because he's a switch hitter with great speed, the ability to play good center field. Uh, Obviously, he's going to play a great left field. And there's another out slug the evs type of guy here because he's too steep or, or too lofty sometimes though like it is a really uphill swing that i think makes it hard for him to get to pitches at the top of the zone and is part of his issue right now with the hit tool because the field of hits not bad he has a feel for the barrel that i think gets undersold you see a lot of people say oh like the hit tool is a problem i think it is because of the the hitch and then the uphill swing but if you look at his ability to kind of throw his hands at pitches uh, to when he's fooled, still get to him, he has a good feel for the barrel. It's just the swing mechanics that are taking him out and the path that's taking him out right now. And I think that's the thing that uh, has to be monitored. But you've got elite speed, elite base stealing, stealing ability. He obviously elevates. And you know, I think the approach is also the thing to monitor with him. It- if I've got a guy that is stealing 79 bases last year, I don't need him swinging for lift all the time. And I can appreciate him trying to get to 20 homers. And like he got to 20 homers last year, but I'm just begging. And I know like Jet, probably 70 runner with good plate discipline. Is Jet a 70 runner? Yeah, probably. Yeah. So like I, I feel like that is the missing player in baseball right now. Like the true 70 runner that is willing to get on base all the time. Yes. And like class A would be so much, I, I think more valuable. And like his first nine games, of the big leagues would have gone better if he was just willing to walk his way on base, like get to first. So you can take second. You are a guy that puts immediate pressure on any arm, any catcher, any battery in baseball, regardless of level, as soon as you're standing on first base, he just doesn't stand on first base enough. And, and yep. I think that's where you hit the prospect fatigue. Um, yeah. Having said that, like, I love what he did in the outfield, man. Like that, he feels like a fourth outfielder. He totally does. At the very least. I, I, that's why, that's why I like him. He's a switch hitter that can be a menace on the base paths immediately and play all three outfield spots. You feel really good that he's at least a fourth outfielder. I agree. And I think that's why he's a top 10 guy. Uh, but there's an everyday role here if he can just do the things that you were saying. And I know it's like just, well, you know, those are big things. But you know, it, there's a very clear hitch in his load. Like he dri- drops his hands down very well and then works uphill that I think clearly is is what's limiting him against fastballs that are elevated. And he crushes stuff down. That's great. But, you know, when you're – exit velocities are already fringy why try to elevate and and be productive that way when you can you have the ability to manip, manipulate the barrel i think better than people give you credit for slap the ball around and and use your speed and don't chase so much because that's been the other aspects for him he's been better with the chase this year which is a nice development and i think since he's gone back to triple a that seems to have been a bit more of a, a focus for him but I, you know, I, I don't know if if he, those are two things together that may be difficult to iron out. But if he irons out one of those things, I think he's a high end fourth outfielder, potentially another one of those second division regular types. Uh, and he is still so young that he could spend this whole year in AAA and work through those things, and then next year still be 22 years old at the start of the season and try to make the big league club. 
and those adjustments would absolutely jump him higher up these rankings. It'd for sure jump him over a guy like who we have at number eight, where it's all reliant on the bat. Like he has enough in his toolbox to feel really good about his future right now. We're just asking him to almost like not elevate a certain area, but like tone down a certain area. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to slug your way to an everyday role. That's just not how Jonathan Class A is going to be an everyday player. It's, it's no. just not going to happen that way. So it, it'll be fascinating to see how his development progresses and if the Mariners try to make those adjustments with him. Yeah. Number eight, you teased it, Tyler Locklear, who's been really solid this year. First baseman, drafted as a third baseman in the second round in 2022, but I think it was always kind of accepted that he was going to move to first base. I will say, you know, if we're talking about swing components and improving them Locklear has and that's why I think he's been much you know much more well-rounded offensively this year I mean you remember how dramatic that that barrel tip was and how yeah. far out his hands were it, it was it was a lot and it was a concern for me because that was another guy that was like I'm watching him getting get potentially blown up inside because his hands were so far out the barrel tip was pretty dramatic and it was it was rapid like he's moving it a lot so it's really hard to to time things up that way he slowed the waggle down the tip is not as as dramatic towards the pitcher and his hands are closer to his body all of those things i think are going to be conducive to more contact more frequent contact in the air and just a better all-around offensive profile i think better swing decisions too and yeah. so far he's been making better swing decisions He's been hitting the ball more consistently. He's hitting the ball harder, and he's having a great start to the year in Double A with a 900 OPS uh, and and really good, you know, batted ball markers. Yeah, th there's more juice than what we've seen in pro ball. I think that's mm -hmm. very clear. It was what 27 homers in about 85 games between his draft year at VCU and his taste of pro ball in 2022. And then last year was what? It was 13 homers. Yeah, 13 homers in. 85 games between high A and double A. Like he's better than that. I this is a guy that, you know, 6'3, 215 on paper, that's selling him short. And it may be the beard that helps me, but like he just looks like a thicker, more mature guy than what his age would suggest. And those are the guys that like you want to be truly menacing in the box. And that'll be the difference between the 50 game power and the 60 game power. If those adjustments that you're talking about are made tangible this year. We're talking about a guy that's going to have 25 homers in the Texas League. I they look they look pretty pretty legit. And when we always talk about with the physical adjustments and then the data backs it up, I look at the physical adjustment, oh, that should help him pull the ball more. Like think about it. Your hands are out in front of you, you're wagging the barrel and you have more movement. It is going to be a lot harder to get to your slot like and then turn yeah. something around inside. Like come on, that's really hard. His pull rate is up 11% this year. So that's one side of it. And it's also going to be easier to elevate because you're, you're so hell bent on turning the barrel over from that position that it's just such a long journey. You're going to get crowded so far this year. His hard hit launch angle is up five degrees. So he's, when he hits the ball hard, it's elevated more consistently and he's pulling the ball more. Those are all things you want to see. And then I think just having more time, those swing decisions being better, he's, he's walking at, at a, 13% clip this season, which is about the same as what he did last year, but that's doing it now at the double A level solely. Uh, I, I like what I like what we're seeing here offensively. I think it's a good progression. I just think there's a lot of pressure on the bat. We still, as you mentioned, have not seen him elevate consistently over a long stretch yet, and he's going to have to do that. Uh, yes, he hits the ball really hard, but you're going to need to elevate and hit a lot of home runs to be an everyday first baseman. Uh, and, and there's going to be some swing and miss, but you know I, I think he's a really solid bat, and there's a there's a clear path to being an everyday player here as he progresses and continues to sustain this progress. If that happens, you can see that everyday player. Can I ask you to look into the crystal ball in three years? Who is the first baseman for the Seattle Mariners? Is it A. Tyler Locklear, B. Ty France? C, the number four prospect in this system, or D, a free agent? You said what year? Three years from now. Let's say 2027. Three years. Oh. 
I'm going to say Locklear. I think he's going to perform enough to get a good look. And then it's just going to be, how does he, how, how does he do in those looks? And I think he's going to be good enough at the big league level where he's going to continue to get opportunity. And then eventually it's like, okay, we have a better option. Cause I think he's going to pulverize lefties at the big league level. I think that's a role that he will guaranteed be able to, to really hold on to. And then we'll see how he continues to perform against righties and, uh, you know, see if the swing and miss becomes a thing, but I, I'll, I'll say he's part of the first base uh, situation still there, but I, I do think that they'll, they'll bring somebody else in at that point, at the very least they'll platoon him, but I think they'll, they'll bring somebody else in. Um, but I do think that he'll be part of the equation there and he, he is going to be a big league contributor for them. Gotcha. Number seven, Ty Pete. He is far off, but he is fun. Part of that trio that we mentioned, uh, thanks to the PPI and uh, another compensation pick. Mariners must have had so much fun drafting last year. Oh, Pete drafted as a shortstop. I, this was some of the more brutal shortstop video, infield video I've watched. Really? From a professional baseball player, for sure. Okay. But he's young, very, very young. He's To put it in perspective, he's a year younger, I think, than his teammate and draft mate, Johnny Farmello. But... I mean, he was a two-way prospect. He could run it up on the mound pretty good, I think, to the mid-90s. But then had elbow issue, I believe. And now is focusing, of course, just on hitting. The arm strength, I don't think, has come all the way back. But the actions are really shaky. I think the arm strength is going to come back. Mm-hmm. But the actions are shaky. The footwork is not great. He's a He's a plus runner, easily. I think he's a center fielder. And I, I don't think it's going to be long before they start putting him out there. He's, he played a lot of the games in the beginning of this year at shortstop. They're already starting to put him more at third base. Maybe, maybe it works there. He's a great runner. He's got a good arm. Let's see him in center. If, the, if, if he's not able to acclimate there well enough, see him in left. I, I, I don't, I don't like him as an infielder, but where I do like him is freak twitch athlete, really nice left-handed swing that has the potential to, to be a powerful swing. I know he has no homers, but the bat speed is impressive. He can get to pitches in different spots. Uh, I mean, he's still learning. I mean, I've seen him adjust. Like I've gone game to game to game. He's playing with feels and just he's 18 yeah. <laughs> and, and they signed him straight to, to low a because I think it's that group that they want to keep together similar to maybe what the Orioles have done and things like that. But also I think, it's it's a guy that just would have almost got bored at the complex because how much better he is than a lot of those guys. But you can see he's still learning. Like he's still trying to f- feel out what's best for him. Uh, but it's wild to see a, a kid in low A at 18 years old tinkering with setups, tinkering with the leg kick, doing these things and still surviving and yeah. still putting up solid numbers. So once he finds those feels and things that work for him, I think we might start to see him really get hot. That that speaks to the overall baseball feel and the and the pure athleticism of him that he's able to survive doing all of these different things. Problem is if if they are going to give him looks in the outfield, it's getting kind of crowded at this point in Modesto. And if you're not going nuts for the nuts right now, I don't know what's wrong with you because yeah. you've got Pete Farmello, Emerson, and Las Montes and Michael Arroyo all on that team. So five of the top ten prospects are all in low A in that lineup pretty much every day. Um, if they want to put him in center, okay, great. What do you do with Farmelo? You know what I mean? Like, th- there's, I, I think there's, it would probably uh, happen once once Farmelo goes up to high A. Yeah, I could see them try. Mm, no, I actually don't see it. You think Colt Emerson and Farmelo kind of travel together? I could see two of those three traveling together and Pete might be like a level behind. Or Montes, dude. I mean, Montes, Montes starting to look bored. We're gonna get to that in a second. Yeah. Um, Damn. I, I think Montes and I think Montes and Farmelo will probably be traveling together before uh, you know, Colt Emerson and yeah, Colt. A little bit of a late start to the year, banged up. Also, extremely young. They could push him a little bit more aggressively, but I wouldn't be shocked if they are a bit slower with him. Yeah. I, I think we could see Montes and Farmelo go together, and then once that happens. Maybe that's where Pete starts to get some run in the outfield. Yeah, and that might be able to take some of the pressure off Ty Pete too, because like I, I bet there is some pressure optically on all of these guys to, oh yeah, perform to a standard that is set by the other two in, in that first round. It's like, oh, we're the trio. We all better debut on the same day. Like that's pressure packed. So as soon as you kind of throw that idea to the wayside, 
I think that could unlock a level of freedom. Farmelo could give him confidence, like, hey, I like they might be some of my good friends, but like I beat the other two to high A. With Pete and Emerson, it's like, okay, like it's not a race. <laughs> like, we're good. We're going to figure this out. I think as soon as they realize that it's not a race, and I have no idea if they view it that way or not, um, if they if they really see it as not a race, I, I think we're going to see a, a smiley, happy type Pete that is going to let the athleticism kind of show its show itself in full force. And a full year younger too. That's mm -hmm. the other really you know an interesting part of this too is you know he's got plenty of time. So I think that's the part where you can kind of look at it and say, okay, well you know I'm I'm going to be on a bit of a different timeline. And also I, I was drafted as a guy that was viewed as as raw, and it was going to be a team that really was excited about my upside. And and I think the Mariners are very excited about the upside because you can't teach that bat speed. I think you can dream on above average power there. You can't teach the twitch. I think the hit tool is going to be fringy no matter what, but I think there's enough there to be able to drive the ball to all fields. If you have above average power, the plate discipline comes along. He's a plus runner and he plays a good outfield. I think there could be a really dynamic and fun player here in Ty Pete. Yeah. Number six, Felnine Celestin. Finally got our pro debut a couple of days ago. Uh, I dove deep into the YouTube archives, I dove deep into any other video I was able to get access to in the last few games I've been able to, to dive deep to. Huge international free agent, almost $5 million in 2023. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I watching some of the video from the academies that you know, I think his academy put it out, I can totally understand why. If I'm, if I'm scouting out there, and honestly, more than the hitting, if I saw Celestin defending the way that he was doing these drills – I'm locked in on that kid and I'm saying, who is that kid? Like, I want that athlete on my team. And that's exactly why I think he, there's been so much fanfare with him. And then you have this suspense because he was supposed to make his DSL debut last year, tweaks a hammy. Let's be careful. Let's make sure he's good. It was a grade two strain. No need to mess around with that. We're talking about a switch hitting shortstop here that has above average power potential, is a plus runner. And I'm telling you, Jack, defensively, I had a ball watching him do all these different drills, <laughs> but also I was able to get video of him in games, things like that. He's going to be a good shortstop. And I know mm -hmm. they're wondering like, Oh, is he going to fill out? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. He's, he's playing shortstop. He's playing shortstop. Is this your first not applicable? Great. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if you caught that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and lie. I'm not going to be like, oh, you know, I, I, I don't know. 40, the swing looks could, like, <laughs> the swing looks like he's going to lack discipline. Yeah. <laughs> I could throw a 40 slash 50 and just say, oh, you know, plate discipline's not bad, but it could be okay. <laughs> we don't know. How could I comment on his plate discipline we if I haven't seen know. him in a game setting <laughs> for more than I don't like know. five at bats? Somebody would figure out a way to just kind of guesstimate what he would be. Yeah, it kind of gives me the vibe of a uh, of a patient guy. Yeah, based on the takes, you know, he didn't flinch in the 10 pitches I saw on some borderline pitches. So, yeah, I think that's good play this one. I will say, in the few at-bats I did see, he didn't expand too much, but it's pretty easy not to expand <laughs> the complex. I think I could go there and, like, I'm not saying I, would, I wouldn't be able to get a swing off, but if I sat there and I said, yes, no, it, I think I'd have a pretty good hit rate on strikes because the nose are nose out of the hand. Like these pitchers are spraying them. Like that's the one thing I think I could do. I could stand in the box and I could say out of the hand, yes, no. And I think most of the time I do a pretty decent job because it's so, it's so hit or miss with these guys. I mean, you have so many non-competitive pitches and then you have a pitch right down the middle and then you have a non-competitive pitch. And if a guy hits the corner, it's an accident. So right. like, it's, it's just a different, it's a different situation, but totally. the bat speed is really impressive. I like the right-handed swing more right now. And that's something I don't love with switch hitters out of the gate, but also he's a teenager and it's fine. It's really early. And he's a righty, strong-handed guy. He can get a little bit from the left side. He can get a little bit draggy and a little bit drifty, super common switch hitter, right, right side dominant. If you're right side dominant and you're hitting from the right side, it's really easy to sink into the back hip and hold it and stay there because you're stronger there. And then your top hand's going to do good work for you. From yeah. the left side, if your right side's the stronger and you're hitting from the left side, it's harder to hold that left hip. No, you're going to sink. It's not going to be as strong, and your top hand is not going to be as strong and direct. That's what I see from him because he's a kid. <laughs> you know, and like that will come along. I, I think we've already seen it come along. I was watching some.
progression. And then even in, in the early swings I was able to see from this year, definitely improved the path from the left side. And in, in the academy video from the left side, he's swinging a short bat one hand with the top hand on the left the left arm and just going and going. I'm like, all right, they've got this guy taken care of. Uh, but so he's been working on that. You can tell. But there's a potential for above average power plus speed, good defense at shortstop, and an average hit tool as a switch hitter. That's a potential superstar. It's super early, and that's yeah. why he's sixth in this system. And the other five guys are top 100 guys. Uh, Farmelo will probably be. Uh, but at the same time, like there's not very many higher upside prospects that aren't in full season ball right now. So he gets a year under his belt at the complex, maybe gets to Modesto for a 10 game sample at the end of the year. Is he a top 100 guy? What are, what are like that? That's assuming that if he gets to Modesto, that means he put up good numbers at the complex, right? Yeah. If he's not punching out, you know, way more than we were expecting. Yeah. Let me rephrase what does he need to do to become a top 100 guy? By someone, year someone tweeted that question. I mean, I was like, Oh, great question. And then I forgot to get back to it. Um, I think keep the strikeout rate in check. Okay. I don't really need to see anything. I, I, I know the defense will be, I don't care if he commits 10 errors. I believe in the defense. Um, I would say keep the strikeout rate in check and not have dramatic splits lefty versus righty. Okay. That's really all I need to see. Cause I know, I know he's going to put, put up good numbers. I know he's going to find his hits there. Um, I don't even care too much about the power just yet. So I would say keep the strikeout rate in check and even splits lefty versus righty. He's a top 100 guy. All right. Number five, Johnny Farmello. He has been really impressive. Another one of these trio first rounders, 29th overall in this past draft. The concern with him outfielder, of course, yeah. was that his swing was a little stiff. There might not be enough hit tool there, or yeah, enough field to hit there, and those types of things. He's improved a lot in that regard. He used to go toe tap, and, and I just don't think the toe tap worked really well for him because he'd lose his body in the process of the toe tap. Some guys, you know, the toe tap helps them stay back. Other guys, the toe tap, the first tap causes the beginning of the leak. Now, he's, he's more of a subtle leg kick guy that's now grown into a bit more of a leg kick. I see him still trying to figure out how big he wants that leg kick to be. Sometimes he looks rushed and it's a shorter leg kick. Sometimes he looks like he's comfortable and it's a bigger one. We've seen guys be able to be malleable like that. Matt Shaw does that. And Farmel is a great athlete, so he might be a, just a malleable leg kick guy. Just something that we have to monitor. I've seen way more adjustability with the, with the bat. And yes, the swing can be a bit rigid at times, but I, I, I've seen better contact rates than I think anybody was expecting. And, and there's the ability to, to now drive the ball the other way that wasn't quite there. It's He likes to get into the pull side. And the, the, work, the driving the ball in the other, other direction is still a work in progress. Yeah. But the swing is definitely geared for pull side pop. But I'm just seeing a little bit more of the shooting the ball the other way, a little bit more of working it back up the middle and being directional because the rigidness of the swing at times would kind of cause that in and out of the zone and a little bit too, too I think, rotational and just kind of not working back through the box and working yeah. more towards the pull side and, and out of the zone. Now we're seeing him you know, have more direction and, and hit it where it's pitched more. And then if you leave something middle in, he'll elevate it. What I love is he elevates consistently. The EVs have been good. The contact rates have been way better than anybody was expecting, and he's extremely patient. Great approach as well. Uh, I think his offensive profile is much more sound than people were expecting out of the draft, which means he's probably a top 100 guy because that was the knock on him. The pros were 70 runner, great defensive potential in center field. And what does the offense look like? Well, if the offense is better than people were expecting, I think you got a top 100 guy here. Damn athleticism grade if you were to grade his athleticism on a 20 to 80 scale what is he at it's got to be 70 he's one of the more athletic guys in the minor leagues might be closer to an 80 i gotta see him box jump or something yeah you gotta see like <laughs> you gotta see him go through an nfl combine i think but but based on what he does on field and based on the draft video that i was able to watch and you know just like getting the glimpse of what he's done in modesto so far this year this guy does seem like one of the more athletic players in minor league baseball already. And he, he's 19 years old. And th there's something about the freak in low way that I can really get behind. And if this guy has plate discipline to complement the freak athleticism, 
That's all I ask for with those guys. And, and the rest will just kind of fall into place. Yeah, and if the hit tool is better on top of that, with the plate discipline being what it is, then you can feel really good. And then again, I, I think that the elevating the way that he has in the 90th percentile so far of 103, 103 mile per hour, 90th percentile, if he's elevating the way that he has is with, with a 35% ground ball rate, like you, you could start to dream on above average pop here. So, I mean, if you have average hit tool, above average pop, above average plate discipline, 70 runner and can stay in center field, that's an well above average everyday player that's going to be a really dynamic player for you uh so you know we'll see if that sustains and i do think that the 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 contact rates may take a hit as he faces better competition yeah. but so far so good and he's looked really comfortable left on left too which is a testament to the body control and pitch recognition which is a great sign also for sure going to number four jack's favorite player lazaro montes who is on a heater right now. Absolute heater. I mean, it's been really cool to see what, what he's doing in terms of, we talked about it, I think, what, last episode, where he's become now this more well-rounded hitter uh, that has the ability to adjust and, and be swings, shooting them you know, into the you know, – just dumping balls into shallow outfield when he's fooled. It's not just the one-dimensional, I'm going to hit the crap out of the ball all of the time type of guy the approach has been good his last 10 games he has been unreal uh and that was a tweet i put out that i knew would be an, an auto retweet from you yeah but his last 10 games 444 519 867 17 percent k rate in that stretch with five homers what's amazing me is the plate discipline and the field the field of hit might end up tricking close or ticking closer to the 45 future instead of the 30 present 40 future that we had, you know, going into this year. And if that's the case, then he, he could be an absolute monster. Can you give me the K rate in his first 26 games in low A? I've got it. I just want to hear you say it. 14%. Yep. That's yeah, I gotta, crazy. I got to overhaul the hit tool grade, huh? From a 70 future game power guy, if he's punching out at a 14% clip in his first 26 games, he's got 152 games in the minor leagues under his belt. 152. Let's play that game. Why not, right? Um, is he punching out at a 26% clip? Yes. But this guy in his first 152 minor league games, and I know it's going to be skewed because I'm accounting for the DSL in 2022, but this guy, 152 is 152. The sample that we have is the sample that we have. He's slashing... 302, 432, 571. That's a 1003 OPS in 152 games, 38 doubles, 29 homers, 141 driven in. He's walked more than 100 times. The plate discipline's impressive um, for such a big zone. I mean, they're saying he's like 6'6, six, 6'7 six, six, now. Uh, and we talked about it the other episode. I love where his hands are at now. And I think that's allowed him to make a lot more contact deeper in the stance, pretty much closer to this, to his preset spot. So doesn't have to travel as far to get to his launch position, sitting there where he needs to be. And it's just a, a subtle load and swing from there. And I think simplifying those things have helped him big time. There was some pretty concerning whiff at the complex. And now you're looking at a guy that's posting palatable you know, contact rates. He has his hands just starting deep. And all he really does is just pull them closer to him instead of having – having them have to go back and get the barrel on plane and all of these different moves that he kind of needed to get to. It's a lot simpler. Now he's way more stacked on the backside. The leg kick is pretty subtle. And I think he's really finding the moves that work for him for such a big guy to be on time early, because that's the key for these big guys is on time early. He's made himself able to do so. And we're seeing the results right now. Uh, I think you could potentially even get to a fringy hit tool here. Uh, and I wouldn't rule out like a 45 potential hit tool, which, you know, then if that happens, he's going to, he's going to be hitting a lot of homers. You know, I don't like playing this game, but if you take out a certain sample size um, and I, I like that point you made about the whiff concerns and the DSL and the adjustments that have been made since then, again, like minor league career, this guy's rocking about a 27% K rate. But if you take out his 56 game sample in the DSL and you just work off the last two years, in 430 plate appearances, this guy is a 21.8% K rate, which is much more palatable. Much yeah. more. And, and going down. As and he hell, 
and held it with that juice, 27 percent's palatable. Yes. And it, you know, he's gonna K more as he gets to more challenging, you know, levels because you're gonna see the average fastball he's seeing right now is 92, 93. You can see more 94, 95s. And just being a big long lever dude, like it, your margin for error becomes thinner. Breaking balls become harder to hit, especially that's the other thing, too, is you know, how is he gonna hit those breaking balls diving downward and things like that? But so far, crushing sliders, curveballs have given him a little bit of of, of a challenge, and that's the thing to monitor. But I think we're seeing him on time for fastballs, which was the biggest thing that he was missing last year. Path is good to hit sliders when he's adjusting. And that's enough for him with the swing decisions now that even if if there's some holes, he's going to be a monster. Um, he's, you asked me last time, when are we going to make him a DH as the position? Now. No. I mean, I, I watched watch him run the bases. He had a triple the other day, and it was, it was, it was really funny. I mean, it's like he's got like clown shoes on. <laughs> Who cares? Uh, but yeah, he's a DH definitely. And That's for okay. you, for for us to rank a DH in the top 100 shows you how how much we think the bat can be a major major contributor. Yep. Speaking of major contributors, right now offensively, Harry Ford has been on one right now. He's the number three prospect in this in this system. Catcher. The defense continues to come along. He's not limiting the run game the way that he should, but overall the defense has come along. He came down to earth a bit over the last two games, but up until that point, when we did that, the YouTube video, you know, this week in minor league baseball, which continue to, to check those out on the call up YouTube uh, would love to continue to hear what you guys think and what you want to see from that. Uh, but it's been really fun putting those together. His last 12 games. I mean, up until this week, he was going crazy. It was a 429, 579, 833 slash line. But even, even if you want to include these two games this week where he's one for nine, he's still hitting 345 over his last 15 games. You can continue to extrapolate it like he's just been mashing over the last several weeks. But what I love is you're seeing him still do the walk more than I strike out thing. Yeah. But you're also seeing the contact rates improve and you're seeing him slug more. And that's that's the thing I was always wondering, right? He elevates consistently, but where was the slug going to be? The EVs are up this year. I think he's just fully healthy. He was a little bit banged up at points last year, but his 90th percentile is up a tick and a half. His, his approach just continues to be phenomenal, and he's elevating. He's a guy that I think can hit 20 home runs and uh, and walk a ton. I don't think the batting average is ever going to be great. It's, it's going to be a fringy hit tool probably, but with the ability to walk, hitting the ball harder now, and elevating, it's a really sound offensive profile overall. So can I tell you what I actually find most impressive about Harry Ford's season? He's hitting 247 right now on the year. So you just extrapolated the last 15 games and you've got him hitting 347. That wrinkle actually gets me more excited because he started the year hitting terribly. And the yeah. fact that he shook off that bad of an early rust Five for 46 to start. Five for 46, and then he goes like 420 over a 10-game sample, 12-game sample. That tells me all I got to know about a guy, that he can compartmentalize struggle. He can compartmentalize That's a catcher. failure. That's a catcher, man. I love that point. Like That is what I want from my catcher. I want somebody that is not going to struggle to sleep when they go 0 for 4 with four punch outs. It was cool when you were in high school. It's cool when you're in college. When you get to pro ball, you cannot do that because you play every day. And if you go 0 for 4 and you have a bad night's sleep, guess what's going to happen the next day? I love that he turned the page like that. I'm with you a thousand percent. And he's worked hard on the defense and, and the receiving is a lot better. The blocking is, has come along. And we were talking about a lot of the, the past balls were uh, inside pitches that I think he thought were going to hit you know, hitters and just kind of flinch a little bit. That's yeah, something you just can work on, can yeah. work on. Everyone has like their, their one, like little quirk, especially a catcher. Uh, I, I I would blink every time someone swung. I, I did it once in little league ball hit me where it shouldn't. And uh, I didn't want to ever catch ever again. I never did. Uh, yeah. So it, and Ronnie Williams on the bump for that one too. When we were 12, he was throwing 80 before anyone should. I, I'm like traumatized from that. Um, the whole inning, just looking at my dad, like, take me out, take me out. So, I mean, it is it is a different beast back there when you are struggling to to hit. And I imagine you catch a foul tip in the face. Guys are stealing on you and you're not hitting. Like, 
those issues could compound big time when you're a 21 year old in double A. Yeah. And it, as you said, it hasn't for him. And what I love is you know, we always talk about the walks don't slump. He wasn't even walking that much in that bad stretch. So I I wouldn't have blamed him if he's like, what's wrong with me right now? I'm not even walking. But yeah, you know, he still was was kept his head up, kept going. And now we're seeing the slug continue to tick up too. I I I love the progression. They've been very methodical with him, as they should. Athletic yeah. catcher, a high yeah. school kid, but you're just seeing the slow burn in the best way possible of what's continuing to become a final product and potentially the catcher of the future when the Mariners don't want to pay Cal Rally or some for some reason. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, it seems like that timeline is going to, is going to work out pretty well. I think he's going to continue to probably play double a most of this year, finish the year with a taste of triple, and then probably start the year next year in triple, and then eventually get up to the big leagues when they need him. That, that timeline sound, seem about right. Yeah, I think so. And if I'm not mistaken, Cal Raleigh still has two or three more years of control. I think I mean, we're seeing might... some teams carry two good catchers nowadays, especially with Ford's athleticism. Uh, you, you can get creative there too. We know he's Dude. athletic enough to play other positions. They've just never really had him do it. I don't blame him because you want him to develop as a catcher. What do you, what year do you think Raleigh's in contractually? Arb, Arb. Is he in Arb one? Wrong. Final year of pre-Arb. He's got all three Arb years left. Woo. That's crazy. Yeah, they might, be, they might do the carry the double catcher situation and, I mean, Ford's so athletic. I'd love to see him play some other positions, but I understand they want to get him as many reps behind the dish as possible. So uh, yeah. regardless, the bat taking the way it is, he's a big leaguer offensively alone, I think, with the speed and, and, and what he brings to the table too. Yeah, I mean, dude, do the Kirk Jansen thing. Like, why not? Yeah, I agree. And like, you never know what happens too. Like, look at where Kirk is, and they're really happy they have Jensen now. Yeah, for sure. Number two, Colt Emerson. Been swinging it pretty well himself. Also, lower half looks a lot better, and and that's a scary thought, I think, because that means that the power, especially to the pull side, could really start to tick up. Probably not a shortstop. I think long term, probably third base, especially with the weight that he's put on. I, I just don't love the defensive actions. But you have the potential here for a plus hitter, above average power, and above average plate discipline. Uh, it's such a sweet swing from the left side. I think still a little bit more room to add some more power. I I, I love this swing. Man, like he's just such a good hitter. Still, just 18 years old. A little bit of a late start because of the injury was, or like missed a little bit because of the injury, but has picked up kind of right away. 909 OPS through 14 games. Still waiting to see him elevate more, but I think he's getting there with the improvements we've seen with the lower half, not drifting as much, holding that back hip. The path is great. The field of hit is great. It's just such a high floor bat for a high school teenager. Yeah, I, I mean, where do you feel like the room for massive development comes? That that's my big thing. It's like, yeah, the game power you've got forty and a fifty-five future, but he just he seems like a young, well-rounded player that's just going to become an older, well-rounded player as he as he yeah. matriculates through the minor leagues. Yeah, I think through swing mechanics and and just overall maturation, he's eighteen years old. Uh, yeah. I don't see like massive physical frame, you know, room, but I think there's still some. And and this is a guy that I mean, we saw flashes last year where he was crushing some balls. It's yeah. a small sample, but he had a 90th percentile of like almost 105 last year. Uh, just too much of it was on the ground. And and that's the thing that I think is really holding him back because when he does have his lower half involved the right way and he is using the ground properly – you can easily see above average power. And I think that's where he's ultimately going to grow into. Uh, but yeah, it's a fair question. Like it might not totally come together that way. And he might be more of the hit over power guy that is a bit flatter to the ball and just sprays doubles everywhere. And if that's the case, then he's probably, a, you know, a 50 power game power guy instead of 55. But I think yeah. at 18 years old, growing into the man strength, getting better with sequencing his moves and, and elevating more consistently with the bat speed that he's able to generate. I just, I think the 20 to 25 home run seems very attainable. Yeah. And, and he just seems like we talked about him during the top 100. Like he just seems like one of the best of the well-rounded at this point. Yes. And, and he is young and he's exciting because he's smooth and he's an advanced ball player at 18 years old. And that yep. is something that you can dream on. Shout out Giffy. 
Yeah, yeah, that's where I get it all if you are wondering where I upload all these. But I was going to try to zoom in on the swing. Do you see his back foot? I know it's really small, but do you see the way that his back foot almost like scissors a little bit? Yeah, it pushes back. There, there are so a lot of like – yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of good hitters that can get away with that. With that's him, the thing. That's what I was going to say. There are a lot of accomplished major leaguers that still do that. Yes, they're they're accomplished major leaguers, and you know, have, have found ways to to be able to you know mitigate that through leveraging other really unique components to their swing, bat speed, wise, physical strength, path, whatever it may be. With him. You know, this is an 18 year old that, you know, I think you really need to be using the ground as, as well as you can. And, you know, when he kind of loses that back foot a bit, I think you'll, you start to lose the ability to lift the ball and you don't have quite as much behind your swing. And, and that's fine in a, in a pitch like this, left on left going the other way. But, you know, we'll see that sometimes on a middle, middle fastball and it'll turn into a double in the gap. But that's a pitch that he probably could have caught a little bit deeper and crushed straight in the air to, to straight away right. So just a little bit of the sequencing side of things, but I love the early slow load. I love his moves. I love I love the fact that he is so under control overall. I, I just think that's going to be the one little final piece is having the upper body and lower body fully in sync and, and using the ground to really tap into what I think can be above average power when it's all said and done. Yeah. Last but not least, Colt or Cole Young. Not off to the best of starts, but it's a big jump to double A. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think even ju just from what I've been able to see from Emerson and since the start of the season, Emerson's closing the gap for sure. What really? separates Young is I think he has above average defensive ability at shortstop. And with Emerson, it's I don't think he's going to play the position. So that helps a lot. Yeah. It's been a lot of bad, bad at ball luck, I think, too, with, with Cole Young in the early going. He's a guy that just, I mean, talk about freak hands. He can get to anything, anywhere. Uh, I think the barrel tip's a little bit too much right now, and I think that's been affecting him some with the timing. But the fa he's just got such freak hands that he can just get to hard stuff inside, throw his hands at stuff outside. I mean, I've watched him keep doubles fair that are six inches inside off the plate. He gets the pitches elevated, down. Uh, and and there's, I think, more power to dream on here now that he's continuing to elevate more consistently uh, and, and puts up decent enough EVs. He, he walks at a good clip. He doesn't strike out and hits lefties. I, that, I would probably say the lefties thing is, is what's held him up the most in double A because he was better last year at that. Lefties in double A have kind of hurt him some. Really? But I, I think he's going to start to settle in pretty soon. You just have such a high floor profile here. Walks a ton, above average hit to potentially plus hit. Uh, doubles power for sure. Can probably sneak out 15 home runs, maybe a little bit more. And just such a tough guy to punch out. Do you have the Cole Young splits this year? I'm pulling up the hand in the splits right now. Just yeah, like so what he's against, yeah. against lefties. It's small sample, 23 at-bats, 612 OPS. Against right, he's 660 because he's just been slow out of the gate. I could pull up last year's. Yeah, I so last year I've I've got last year's right in front of me here. Um against lefties last year. Um 82 at bats in Modesto, a 740 OPS against righties in Modesto, an 850 OPS. In Everett, 48 ABs for him against lefties, a 660 OPS. Against righties, a 960 OPS. So lefties like have posed an issue, but probably not as egregious as yeah. this year. But then again, like he's not hitting righties right now either. Yeah. Um, but again, like we're only a month <laughs> into the season and baseball is a long game. There are a lot of top prospects that have bad months. Um, wow. Like that kind of took me by surprise when you said Colt Emerson is closing the gap on Cole Young. And I know that Emerson is a guy that was right around 50 for us, but Cole Young was a guy that was right around 20 for us. Yeah, no, I think it's more of just a testament to just how impressive the swing is from Emerson. Like, it just continues to get better and better and better. And the second that he can, you know, on the Emerson front, start to tap into that pull side pop, because we were talking about it, I remember, a lot, like, during the offseason, the EVs were so impressive with Emerson, but because of that inconsistency with the lower half, everything that was hard hit was the other way. 
he, he was not able to stay behind his body and and turn 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 on stuff. Now he's starting to turn on stuff a little bit more, and that that's a scary recipe. Uh, but that's more. I think Cole Young's still in the same spot, and now I'm seeing Emerson as a guy that's probably going to be in the top 35 when we do an update. So just kind of closing in there a bit, uh, just because I think there's a bit more of a ceiling. But with Cole Young, you got everyday shortstop. You have such a sound offensive profile. And even over his last seven games now, sitting 290 over that stretch, uh, several multi-hit games. He had three straight two-hit games. Yeah. So it seems it, this is his first taste of double A. Remember, he's making the jump straight up from high A uh, yeah. at the end of last year. So ultimately, I, I think he's going to start to hit the ground running. And when that happens, you're going to start, or I think he's going to start to settle in, I should say. And when that happens, when he is locked in, I mean, you just, you can't punch him out. There's not really a blue zone for him and he gets yeah. to everything. And I think that's what we're, we're going to see sooner rather than later. So from what you said, while Cole Young might be slightly sliding, Farmello's in the top 100, possibly. Montes is a riser, Ford is a riser, and Emerson's a riser. Yeah. And I mean, Cole Young's just holding Pat. I, I, I don't think he's going to slide at all. Unless, I mean, if we, we see three more weeks of this, maybe a little bit, I'd have to watch yeah. more IBs and see if something stands out to me. Again, I think just that barrel tip's a little much for him. And it's yeah. it's become now he's a bit more rushed in in double A compared to what he was dealing with in in high A. But other than that, I mean the average fastball velocity that he's seen saw 92 mile an hour average fastball velo last year. So far this year, average heater is 93 and a half that he's seen. So little things like that can be the difference. Uh, and but if that's if he's able to tone that down a tad, I think we're going to see him start to really get rolling here. And and to me, he's still one of the better shortstop prospects in the game. I already told you I'm nuts for the nuts, but like I've got Mariner fever at this point, man. Yeah. Like they're fi- they're such an easy team to root for, too. Oh my gosh. They're yeah, a good I, I've wanted them to be good for so long. It's yeah. been so annoying. But so uh, final final note on this system for me. Without looking, you know the last pitcher that we talked about? The last pitcher? It was uh Lo- Logan Evans. At eleven? Yeah. So their top 10 are hitters. What are the Mariners good at right now? Pitching. They've got the best rotation in baseball, and all those guys have multiple, multiple, multiple years of control. They extended Castillo. I think Gilbert is in his final year of pre-arb. Kirby is what, year three of pre-arb? Gilbert might be arb one, I'm not sure. But then like you've got Miller and Wu that are both just getting started in their careers. You've got Hancock kind of trying to figure out who he is, and he's in year one of his major league career. You have a rotation moving forward. Oh, yeah. And Jerry DePoto is as good at this as I think we've got like outside of tier one. Like I kind of consider tier one to be Alex Anthopoulos and Friedman and Neander and, you know, maybe Mike Elias, but I think DePoto is not far off from Mike Elias at this point. I, I agree. I mean, I think he's doing a lot, especially with the way that he's able to load up this farm. And, and I think, yeah, we look at what the Padres do. There's certain teams that are just on a similar wavelength of the way that they're able to load up. And then I love the way that the difference with, with DePoto is I think when he pushes the chips forward, I think he does it a little bit more tactfully uh, and, yeah. and and a little bit more carefully. And I, I'm interested to see if they try to do that one more time here to, to bolster this team if they start to show some good signs of life. But um, Young, I think, is is going to be a big part of that future. And I think we'll kind of get the reins from Crawford when that time finally comes. But I'm interested to see how they go about that, too. Ultimately, Young could end up being at second base. And if he does that, he's going to be a elite defender there. The bat's going to be really solid there. And, and he could be a guy that hits as many doubles as anyone. So... Really fun organization. I think I want this team to be good so badly. I think they're getting there. It just it's not. It's been a little bit more of a process. Uh, and I, I hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll continue to fly through these minor league or, or these farm systems by team each week here, and we will probably stick with this division. It kind of just depends what what where where I'm at and what I'm excited about <laughs> that given week. But uh, we will definitely have another farm system for you next week. That'll do it for this episode. Hope you have a great weekend and look forward to talking prospects with you next week.